Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I want to start off with, uh, by, by asking a question uh, just to get a little bit of a poll. Uh, how many of you guys have heard uh, the, this phrase or a phrase that's kind of similar to it? Faith is freedom from doubt. Has it, have any of you heard something like that? Or, or, uh, yeah? Okay. Well, if you've heard that, if you've heard, if you've heard something like that, if, uh, or, or you haven't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, the, the thing is, is that we all doubt. Uh, last Mark, like Mark said, all of us have doubts, and, and there's a good reason for that. Um, in the grand scheme of things, we have a very limited ability to really uh, get a full grasp of the world around us. We're limited to our own senses and, and to our rather short lifespan to actually test out our world. Of course, we also have a bunch of other people. We're in a community, um, and so we can uh, pull on each other's own experiences, our own, uh, uh, own senses to, to learn more about the world. But the thing about, uh, about learning about the world is that you find out how little you actually know. If you draw a circle that represents all the knowledge that could be known in the world, just everything that, there is, uh, everything that is knowable is in that circle, uh, and then you had to cut out a slice of that circle uh, that represented how much you know, uh, what would it look like? If you're a teenager, it probably would be like half the circle. Uh, if you're wise, it would probably look something like this, just like a half of a half of a half of a percent. If you are a little bit wiser, it might, be, it might look something like this, uh, just a little dot in that sea of knowledge. And if you're Socrates, it would probably look like this. As he said, there is but one thing I know, and that is I know nothing. <sighs> okay, a little philosophy joke. That's, uh, we'll move on. Uh, the point is, uh, there is a lot of room for doubt. Uh, there's a lot of room for a doubt in our lives uh, because no matter how old you study, no matter how, uh, much, uh, how much you, you know, there will always be things that we, we're not quite sure about. And for that reason, we will, uh, there's always going to be room for doubt. Uh, the question that we're fo focusing in on today is, uh, why do I doubt if I believe? As noted before, um, to doubt, it's, it's simply just to be human. And yet, when it comes to our faith, uh, starting to doubt or challenge those things that we, we are told to believe, um, it can be kind of scary. It can, uh, we can hesitate to do that. Um, I mean, what, what will happen if you actually doubt or, or challenge or question the things that I'm preaching or the things that, that Mark preaches about or Pastor Zardy or Pastor Tim? Uh, what happens if you doubt the, very, uh, the core questions, the four core tenets of the faith? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Is my salvation really secure? There are so many things, both big and small, that happen in our life that cause us uh, to reflect on what we believe, what we, uh, what we have been taught, and to challenge them. So how do we deal with those questions? And can we be faithful while holding on to doubts? If you've ever been afraid to explore, uh, explore doubts, especially doubts of the faith. Um, if you've ever asked the question, why do I doubt if I believe? Uh, like Mark said, know that that's okay. Uh, it is okay to have doubts. Uh, doubts are not only completely reasonable, but by actually challenging what we believe, we can actually uh, grow deeper in the faith. The question is not, why do you doubt? It's, it's pretty clear why we doubt. Oh, we're human. We don't have all the information. Instead, the question is, what is the source of your doubt, and what are you going to do about it? One of my, uh, one of my favorite theologians is uh, a pastor by the name of Tim Keller. Have any of you read any of his stuff? Um, I think he's, he's quite possibly the best modern theologian out there. Um, he is, he's a pastor out in New York City at Redeemer Presbyterian. Uh, he's, been, uh, he's had a decades of ministry. Uh, and he's been witnessing to one of the most skeptical and educated populations in the world. And yet, even in the midst of all this skepticism and all of the jadedness uh, that comes with, uh, with it, Tim Keller's ministry continues to grow. And the reason for that is because he allows people to doubt. 
He allows people to actually challenge, his, uh, challenge the faith that he proclaims. But he also challenges uh, the faith and the beliefs of those people that he's witnessing to. Uh, Tim Keller believes that, that doubt is uh, it, it's a good thing. In fact, he says in, the re- in his book, The Reason for God, a faith without some doubts is like a human body without antibodies. People who blithely go through life, too busy or indifferent to ask the hard questions about why they believe as they do, will find themselves def- defenseless against either their experience of tragedy or the probing questions of a smart skeptic. A person's faith could collapse almost overnight uh, if she fails over the years to listen patiently to her own doubts, which should only be discarded after long reflection. Doubts, they can rise up at any moment. More often than not, they come bearing down on us when we're faced with trials, uh, trials in our life. Uh, this can happen when a loved one is taken from us unexpectedly. It could happen when we face a rough patch in a relationship with, uh, with a friend or a family member. Uh, it could just come up by someone who is smarter or quicker than us, challenging what we believe. Um, in any of these moments, uh, what we are taught what is true and right, uh, what we are taught about God and our faith, uh, they can suddenly come into question. And in those moments, we have one of two options. We can either ignore our questions, ignore our doubts, try to distract ourselves from them, or we can actually explore the doubts. And like anything in life, it is much better to actually explore our doubts than try to suppress them. The reason why we should explore our doubts is because uh, doubts are not bad. Uh, Doubt in and of itself, it's not bad. It's a halfway point between faith and disbelief. When we begin to explore the things that we question, we can actually start to reflect on why we believe why the things we believe. Why do we hold them as true? And as we explore those questions of doubt, our faith actually can grow stronger. But as we deal with the doubts, as we look at the doubts, we need to actually do it honestly. More often than not, our doubts, they come out uh, when we're faced with something that we don't really like. There are a lot of times when uh, what we believe as true, what we're called to do, uh, directly contradicts what we actually want to do. As Christians, God calls us to do a lot of things that are hard, a lot of things that we don't really want to do. I mean, he calls us to forgive radically, to forgive people even when it seems crazy to do so. He calls us to chase living. He calls us to self-sacrifice and to, and to love generously. These things are hard. These things also can look weird to people who are not part of the church. And so when we come up against the things that we're called to do versus the things that we want to do, we can start to doubt. And we need to respond to it. To respond to a doubt about faith by saying, you don't want to believe because it means that you have to uh, do something different than what you want to do. It's, it's a, that's a dishonest approach. That's like saying that uh, I don't believe that that bill exists because I don't want to pay it, right? Like, we know what happens when the, uh, if you do that. Somebody is going to come, uh, come a-knocking. That's just what happens. Doubt, it can arise out of fear and defiance. It can grow out of anger or pain or it's, it can come out of simply being challenged by someone else. When doubts arise, be honest with it. Be honest with why, uh, why you're, you're wrestling with what you're wrestling. So what does that look like to be honest with our doubts? What does it look to, like to, be, uh, to wrestle honestly with our doubts? Well, we don't have to do it alone. And so when you're wrestling with doubt, uh, uh, know that you're not alone. There are countless examples out there of people who have wrestled with their doubt faithfully and honestly. And many of them have become pillars of the faith because they wrestled with doubt. For instance, uh, what is, what's the, our, our denomination, it's, it's, we're called Lutheran. 
The reason why we're called Lutheran is because of a man named Martin Luther who spent much of his early adulthood, uh, adult life, uh, doubting whether or not he has been saved, doubting his own salvation. Now, he had, uh, he had been told, he'd been proclaimed to him that he has, uh, he has been saved by Christ. And yet much of what he's been uh, told also caused him to doubt it. He believed that uh, in order to receive forgiveness, one had to be completely, uh, uh, they had been completely repentant of what they had done. And so Martin Luther, he spent uh, hours and hours in the confessional, seven to eight hours sometimes in the confessional, reciting all of the things that he had done wrong. And he was a monk. He lived in a monastery, so there couldn't have been that much that he did wrong. And in fact, there were times where his confessor actually had to tell him to go uh, get away and, and come back when you actually have something real to confess. But Martin Luther, he was burdened because he knew that he wasn't, he wasn't repentant of everything. There was always something else on his mind that he needed to repent. He doubted whether or not he was really saved. He doubted the things that he'd been told. And it wasn't until he actually dove into the word of God, actually looked at the gospel, that he discovered how deep God's love actually is for him and for all people. It was in this moment that uh, Martin Luther rediscovered the gospel. And by doing so, he set the world on fire. Uh, the Christian church probably wouldn't look like it does today if it wasn't uh, for Martin Luther actually challenging his doubt and rediscovering that gospel. It's not just historical figures, though. It's not just historical figures that we can look to uh, as examples of wrestling with doubt. We see it all the time in Scripture. We have, uh, we have David, uh, as, as, Mark, uh, as Mark read before. In the New Testament, uh, what is the one character that we associate with doubt the most? Thomas, right? Uh, what do we call him? Doubting Thomas. <sighs> he's a bad rap. I mean... If you look at why he's called Doubting Thomas, and, and you read just a little bit before, you see that all the disciples were wrestling with the same exact question that he was wrestling with. And the only reason why he, uh, he's called Doubting Thomas is because when he came in the door afterward, uh, he didn't believe, all the, what, uh, believe what the disciples had told him. See, Thomas was wrestling with what Christ had proclaimed before he died. Thomas was questioning whether or not Jesus really was the Messiah. Could he really rise from the dead? Is he really the one who is going to rescue God's people, to rescue them from sin, death, and the devil? A few days before, Thomas saw Christ hang on the cross and die. He saw his limp body being taken from the cross and put into a, into a tomb with a stone rolled, away, rolled in front of it. All of his senses, all of his experiences pointed to the fact Christ wasn't actually who he said he was. He wrestled with his doubt. He came, uh, and when he came face to face with his Savior. In that moment when he saw the risen Christ, the risen, G uh, the risen Jesus stand before him, when he felt his nail wounds on his hand and on uh, the, the spears piercing on his side, when he heard his voice in that moment, Thomas set aside his doubt, cast it away, and proclaimed Christ as Lord. He got down on his knees and said, Lord, I believe. And in that moment, like Luther, Thomas set the world on fire. He went out onto, into Asia and spread the gospel. And there are churches today in southern, in southern India that attribute their founding to Thomas. That's 2,000 years of the gospel being proclaimed into these communities because of Thomas, because he wrestled with his doubt. Thomas, Martin Luther, these are great men. But one of the most amazing things about Christ, about our God, is that uh, as the author of Hebrews says, we have a God who can actually empathize with us. You see, our, cry, our, our, our Savior has walked in the same footsteps that we walk. He has wrestled with the same temptations that we wrestled with. He has, doubt, he has doubts in the same way that we have doubts. In fact, 
we have, uh, we're, we're told about how Christ himself wrestled with doubt in the garden that night before he went to the cross. He knelt down on his knees and he prayed. And he was so overcome with anxiety that he was sweating blood over what was to come. He cried out to God. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. He didn't want to go to the cross. He knew what was, in, what was ahead of him. He knew what it meant to be crucified. I mean, who'd want to die that way? It's still considered one of the worst ways to die. It's agonizing. And yet, he wrestled with his faith, and he declared his resolve by saying, let not my will be done, but yours. Christ bore out the punishment that every one of us deserve, because if he didn't, the world would be lost. He submitted himself to the plan of the Father, and for that reason we have hope, for that reason we have life. This is our faith. This is what it's founded on. Our faith, it's the same faith as Martin Luther and Thomas. It is founded in what Christ did after his agonizing prayer in the garden. When he went to the cross, when he died for you and for me, and on the third day he rose again and proclaimed that victory over sin, death, and devil to Thomas and to the rest of the disciples and to hundreds of other witnesses who saw the resurrected Lord Jesus. This is our faith. This is what we believe in. The answer to why do I doubt is not because your strength is, your faith is not strong enough. The issue is not how strong your faith is, but how strong is the one you put your faith in. The core question we, uh, we Christians need to answer is this. Is Christ really powerful enough to do the things that he promises us and did Christ really rise from the dead? And does that mean that we have victory over sin, death, and the devil? These are the questions that Thomas wrestled with. These are the questions that Luther wrestled with. These are the core questions of our faith. When Thomas and Luther and many, many other Christians before them wrestled with, the, uh, wrestled with these questions, they came back with a resounding yes. Yes, Christ really is powerful enough to do what he promises. Yes, Christ really did rise from the dead. And he offers us forgiveness of sins, life, and hope because of it. Doubt, it can lead you to really examine the questions. And when we deal with them honestly, when we really deal honestly with our doubt, we will find out just how incredible our God is. As kids, we're told that Jesus loves you. That is absolutely true. But when we actually start challenging it and looking into it, we start to uh, see the incredible truth that is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Just how deep that love actually is. Just how deep the forgiveness that Christ has brought to us. See, Christ rose from the dead. And he has forgiven all of your sins, all of your failures, both past, present, and future. He's forgiven all of them. And this is done through his death. And because of his death and his resurrection, we really do have eternal life. Our faith is true. And when, when you look around the world, you can see that, that uh, it's not far-fetched what we believe, that this is not a fantasy. You see, the great thing about our faith is that you don't just have to blindly follow what we're saying. Uh, our faith is grounded in reality. You can actually doubt and challenge it, and it can hold up. Men and women far smarter than me have done this and come out with the same conclusion that Martin Luther and Thomas and so many, Christian, uh, so many other Christians have, that Christ really is the Savior. Um. <clears throat> you see... Faith, it's not living without doubt. Faith is trusting that God's promises are true, despite your doubt. It is not uh, blindly following what you have been told. Instead, it is resting securely in the things that God has promised to you. There will be times when we will not have the answer, where we'll simply have to say, I don't know. That's okay. 
We know that we, don't have, we may not have all the answers. We know that we may not have all the facts and we may not have the full view of the situation. What we do know is that we have a God who loves us, a God who has revealed to us everything that we do need to know. In that moment, we express the faith that Christ, said, uh, that Christ expresses. Not our will be done, but yours. Again, this does not mean that you stop asking questions. It just means that amid your doubts, you continue to trust in the almighty and all-powerful God. So if you have doubts, don't run from them. Confront them. Uh, explore your feelings, why you're feeling that way, and look for answers. And as you do so, don't do it alone. Like everything in life, uh, it's better to, uh, to go and find help. I guarantee that there is somebody out there who has asked the same question that you have asked. In fact, if you look around, there are hundreds of brothers and sisters sitting next to you, and I guarantee that there are at least several dozen who have wrestled with the same exact question that you have wrestled with, that you are currently wrestling with. They can help you. But we're not just limited to this, uh, to this room for, uh, for advice. Again, as the author of Hebrews says, we are surrounded by a whole cloud of witnesses. We have generations upon generations of Christians who have wrestled with, uh, with difficult questions of faith. Probably every question that there is to have about the faith, they have wrestled with. So mind their thoughts. If you remember back to that circle, uh, there's a whole sea of knowledge, and that can be rather scary to, uh, to start going into. So look for guidance. Uh, if you need help, if you, want, uh, if you want help looking for questions, if you want uh, guidance and direction on where to look to find these questions and uh, to find these answers, uh, come talk to Pastors Artie and I. We have devoted our life to this. We want to help you. We want uh, to help you search out your doubts, to challenge your doubts, to explore uh, your questions. This is what we want. And I guarantee that there is not a question that is uh, too offensive or, or too shocking or too blasphemous uh, to ask. Uh, we want to help, and so come talk to us. And finally, at the end of it all, do not lean on your own senses or reason alone, but cling to the promises and actions of Christ. They are true. While we don't have the physical crucified uh, body of Christ before us now, we do have the eyewitness account of those people who spent three years walking with him, three years of listening to his preaching, listening to his promises and his, and his words, who saw his death, and who touched his skin, who touched his resurrected skin, his wounds, and heard his living voice after the fact. We have their account. So read them. Read the words. Question it, yes, but believe. Believe because they are true. Doubt, it's not the enemy of the faith. So don't run from it. Instead, face it with the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, as it continues to guard our hearts and our minds until Christ comes again. Amen. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us a Savior. Um, that, uh, you don't just have us, uh, give us a Savior who we, we can only um, imagine or believe. It. You've given us a Savior who has actually lived uh, a human life, who has experienced the same experiences that we have uh, who has wrestled with doubts, uh, uh, doubts that we have, um, but most of all, who has gone, uh, gone to the death, uh, gone to death, and 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 won victory over it. Uh, Lord, help us uh, to believe. Help us to to trust in the promises that Christ has won for us, um, and to share that. Lord, as we doubt, uh, encourage us to look for uh, for help um, in wrestling with them, uh, so that. We can uh, proclaim with one voice uh, the truth that you have given to us. All these things we pray in your name. Amen.